Hi guys, welcome back to the channel. Hope you all are doing well. Today we're going to learn about a new geocoding method called geohashing. It's a pretty common technique or algorithm that you can use to build different applications like dating apps, chat apps, or even proximity searches like Google, Uber, Lyft, or Yelp, where essentially you want to find a bunch of points of interest around your location. So when it comes to the definition, uh, geo, uh, a geohashing is nothing but a geocoding method used to encode geographical coordinates like latitude and longitude into a short string of digits and letters. If the definition doesn't make too much sense, let's go down to this diagram over here and then we're gonna actually break down the definition to kind of explain how it works. So the first step you want to take is divide the world into four distinct cells, right? So in level one, you see that we have a grid with four different cells, and then we encode them by calling them zero, one, two, and three. These four cells right now represents all the area in the world for us. Now you want to take one of the cells. So in our case, we're taking cell two, and then break it down even farther into four new cells, each of them representing a smaller area than the whole cell two was, right? So we take two, break it down into four cells and call them two zero, two one, two two, and two three. Now each of these uh, new cells, they represent a smaller amount of area than the whole cell called two was representing. Now, in the next step, you take one of the newly divided cells, in this case, we are taking one three, and then divide it down into four new cells, which are gonna be smaller yet again. And all we do is add a new uh, digit to the code. So we go from one three to one three zero, one three one, one three two, and one three three. By doing so, so just by adding that one extra digit to the code, all we're doing is zooming into the map. So we are breaking a large area into four more smaller area and giving it an ID so that when someone tells you, give me the area of the world that has the code 130, you can give them this whole block. So anything that lies within 130 will have this coding with it, right? So whatever long, uh, whatever latitude or longitude your location has, it will, fall, it will fall in one of these uh, encoded boxes. So as we talk about more of the examples later down, you'll get a better idea. So to put it in words, imagine the world is divided into a grid with 32 cells. Each cell is given an identifier. Then that grid is divided farther and given another identifier and we go on and on, right? So that's exactly what we did. We started with four cells and then from there we kept on zooming in. And every time we zoomed in, so every time we divided one cell into four more, we added another digit to the code to identify it further. So by adding the characters, you are essentially zooming into the map, right? So you, we had two to begin with and then just by adding one character, so a zero, a one, a two, or a three, we zoomed into the map. So now this whole area two is broken down into four distinct areas, each having a new unique identifier. So you have two zero, two one, two two, and two three. The more characters that you have in the string, the more precise the location. So you see, look at two over here, and then look at two zero, two one, two two, or two three. You can see that just by adding that one extra digit, you zoom into the map now that now now each of your cell is if even more precise than it was at the beginning same goes for level two to level three we started with one three and now that we break down one three into four new cells we have smaller chunks of region each of them being encoded with one extra digit so we essentially go from one three to 130, 131, 132, and 133. So uh, 
the takeaway you should have from here is the more the greater number of digits that you have in this code the more precise your location is going to be right so the amount of area represented by 1 3 is significantly more than the amount of region represented by 130, 131, 132, or 133, okay? So to give you a more realistic example, this is the map of San Francisco, and you can see that this is a result of us breaking down those grids into, so you see, in level three, we had three digits, right? Now here we have one, two, three, four, five. So we have four digits. So this is after breaking down our map for uh, five levels, okay? So once you break it down into five levels, you can see that each of the cell is representing a very small part of San Francisco, not even like one whole region. So the city itself is now divided into what? Three, six, seven, eight. So eight by four, so 32 cells. Right, so San Francisco has been divided into like 32 cells right now for you to work with, okay? And uh, one thing you wanna note is that the prefix is very similar. So all of these have 9Q8, even Y I think, right? Yeah, so you have 9Q8Y. This is common in all of these cells. The only thing that changes is the last digit because that's being used to differentiate one from the other. So you can see starting from top left, you have uh, 8YB and then 8YC, 8YF, G, U, V. So you can see the only thing that's changing is the last digit. And that's what's making each of the, each of the cells unique. Now, if you wanted to break this down even farther, let's take a look at, uh, I don't know, let's take a look at 9Q8YU, so the one over here. If you wanted to break this down farther, all you have to do is add another digit to it. So let's say you can have 9Q8YUABC, something like that, where now each of the new cells will represent a smaller area within this box that you see over here. So that kind of goes back to what we talked about at the beginning, where by adding extra digits to your code, you are essentially zooming into the map and being more precise with your location. So hopefully uh, this map and this one does a good job to show you how exactly the code is formed and how you're uniquely identifying one region over the other. I'm gonna have both these graphs and the articles, uh, sorry, both these maps and the articles related to them in the description below. So feel free to take a look at that one. All right, so now that we have a uh, sort of an idea of what geohashing is, let's see how you can use geohashing to find points of interest. When I say points of interest, what I mean is think about apps like Uber, Lyft, Google Maps, or Yelp. For all these, you're essentially solving the same problem where you have a location, which is the location of your user, and you wanna find a bunch of things that are around or nearby the user. In the case of Uber or Lyft, that is gonna be the drivers surrounding the user. So let's say a user goes to the app and they wanna f see uh, how many drivers are there around uh, the user. Using geohashing, you can easily find what uh, drivers are near the user and where exactly they are. We're going to talk about the details of how you do that, but that's essentially the application of geohashing in ride, uh, ride sharing services like Uber and Lyft. And then you have Google Maps or Yelp, which are applications that you use to find interesting points around you. So there can be maybe hiking spots or restaurants or just any kind of a local business that you're interested in. And you can use geohashing in those cases too. And let's figure out how you want to do that now. So you can use a user's latitude and longitude to determine points of interest around the user. These are the steps that you want to go through. The first thing is you get the user's latitude and longitude. Uh, if you have a mobile app, you can get it from the mobile's operating system. 
If it's a web app, you can get it from one of the APIs. But anyway, all you need is the user's latitude and longitude. From the latitude and longitude of the user, in step two, you can compute the geohash. When I say compute the geohash, I essentially mean taking the longitude uh, and latitude and breaking it down into a geohash. So for instance, a 9q8ys or a 9q8yq, something like that. There are multiple libraries in like all programming languages where you can give the library uh, latitude and longitude as input and it's going to spit out the entire geo code to you, right? So in this case, we're only seeing a part of the geo hash. So we're seeing one, two, three, four, five. So we're seeing the first five digits, but a geo hash can be as long as I think like 12 or 13 digit, which means essentially it's going to be like if a user is there and you have their geo hash, if you go all the way down to like the uh, 12 digits, you can literally pinpoint the user in the world. If you want to zoom out and get nearby locations, you want to take a smaller chunk of the prefix. You don't want all 12 digits because that means you're essentially going to be finding points that are like exactly where the user is, right? Instead, you want to find things like three or within three or four miles of the user. And that's why you take a prefix of the geohash and not the whole one. So, so you compute the geohash of the user. Now you know where exactly the user is and what's their geohash. And now you determine what prefix you want to use to match the locations to the user, right? As I mentioned, if you are trying to find other locations around the user with the exact same geohash, so all 12 digits, you're not really going to find anything because that's literally asking the algorithm to tell you what is there literally in front of the user, like a few feet from the user. But instead of that, when you're talking about nearby businesses or drivers, you want to, of course, expand your search and see what's there within a few miles of the user, not a few feet. So this ta table can kind of does a good job to show you what length to, uh, to kind of consider depending on your application. So of course, if you're only matching the first digit of the geohash, which is a geohash length of one, you can see that covers the whole world almost. So like one fourth of the whole world, which is a lot of area. You don't really want that. But if you go down to like around five, six or seven, that's when we're, let, let's talk about six, right? That's uh, uh, area width in meters and area height in meters. So that is what? 122 times six and 10. What is that? That's like 74,000 meters, which is, which is like 74 kilometers. So, you can see what I where I'm where I'm getting at, right? Like by determining which prefix you want to match, you can essentially shrink down the area of the points of interest around the user. So if you want, if you go down and match uh, eight prefix, that's gonna bring you to thirty eight times nineteen. That's seven twenty two divided by one thousand. So zero point so around a mile, uh, sorry, around a kilometer, right? So if you're matching the geo, the first eight digits of the geohash of the user with the first eight digits of the geohashes of locations around the user, you're essentially finding all the locations that are within 0.7 uh, kilometers of the user. Okay. So depending on your, so what you can do is start with a uh, start with a longer prefix, and then go shorter and shorter as you find less and uh, as you find uh, less locations, right? So let's say you try a geohash of eight, and you find like one location only. So you can uh, dial it down to seven, and now you can find like three or four more location. And then you dial it down to six. And then let's say now you have like 20 locations, which is enough for your application. And then you can just pick six at that point. Okay. So in step three, it was determine what prefix you want to use. 
That's what I exactly explained. The longer the prefix, the closer together the points are going to be. So you want to match the prefix with geohashes of points of interest. All the points of interest, so whether these are static location of businesses or more dynamic locations of drivers, they are going to have a latitude and longitude. And of course, you will have a geohash corresponding to those lat and long. Now you can go ahead and match your latitude and longitude of the user to the, sorry, the geohash of the user to the geohash of these points of interest. And depending on the prefix, you will get either a lot of uh, points or less number of points. Once you do the matching, you can start optimizing the count of points of interest that you're getting. If you want to reduce the number, uh, if you want more points, so more data, you can reduce the number of prefix match because you're essentially expanding your search by reducing the number of points. If you want less points, then you can increase the number of prefix match. So now you're zooming into the map and trying to find locations that are very, very close to the user. So hopefully that gives you a good idea about what geohashing is and how you can use it in different applications. A few of the system design videos I'm going to do in the following weeks are going to use the concept of geohashing. That's why I felt like it's important to explain how the algorithm works before I actually refer to them in the video. So even when you're looking at those uh, or watching those videos, if you want a refresher on geohashing, I'm going to refer you back to this video. And in the description of the video, I'm going to have a bunch of references, which are going to be YouTube videos and articles that I used to learn about geohashing. So hopefully that's also going to give you a better idea. One last thing I'm going to leave you with is this tool. Uh, let me see. Yeah. So this is an interactive tool where you can give it like a latitude and longitude. And then let's say you want to have a precision of three and you see like the map zoomed out and then you can have a precision of like, so let's say you want to go closer, like you want to zoom in. So you go from three to four. Now you zoomed in. Okay. And now let's say you want to zoom in even farther. There you go. You zoomed in even more. So this is a pretty cool tool that you can use to kind of visualize how the geohashing works. Uh, I'm also going to link this in the description for you to kind of play around with. So with all that being said, hopefully this was helpful. If you have any questions, please leave them in the comments below. And if you have any feedback on the format of the video or the, the way I explain things, please put them in the comments too. I'm always looking to kind of get better and explain things better. So let me know if there's anything that I can do, which is going to be more helpful. With that being said, I hope you guys have a good rest of the day and I'm going to catch you in the next one. Bye-bye.